Paul reveals God's plan for Israel and for the Gentiles. We explore the interplay of God's purpose, God's election, our deeds and His calling. This morning we are back into the book of Romans. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans chapter 9. And uh, like last Sunday, uh, the Sunday before last, uh, we are going to do a quick overview of three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11. So we're not going to read every verse and explain that, uh, but I want to just share with us the gist of these three chapters, Romans 9, 10, 11. I'd encourage you, please, to uh, make use of the sermon notes that, that is up on the website. Those of you who really like to study the Word, it's, uh, it's available for you. You can take the sermon notes, and in the sermon notes, there are, there's much more detail, uh, explanations of verses, and, and, and sometimes reference the Greek, sometimes we cross-reference Scripture. So a lot more information is there in the sermon notes, and you can study it further if you'd like. And uh, so uh, in the 40 minutes that we spent together, we're going to just uh, give an overview of these three chapters. But let's just recap uh, very quickly uh, the past few uh, lessons we've covered in the book of Romans and uh, then we will pick this up and go forward. So Romans is, is Paul's uh, presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, explaining to us the good news of Jesus. Uh, in chapter 1, after his introduction, he uh, mentions to us how God has revealed himself to us in creation. And then he talks, starts talking about the depravity of man, how man has sinned and gone away from God, Romans 1. Romans 2, he brings out the fact that, none of, that we cannot save ourselves by our works. None of us can be saved by our works, by the works of the law. Then in chapter 3, he says, Therefore, since we have all fallen short of the glory of God, all of us stand judged and condemned before God, Romans chapter 3. And then in the middle of chapter 3, Romans 3.22, he begins to tell us, Look, but God has saved us freely by His grace. By His grace. He saved us, each one of us. Then he begins to present the, the good news, justification by faith, that we could be saved simply by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4, he highlights the fact that righteousness is a gift given to us by God in response to our faith. And this was even from the Old Testament. From the time of Abraham as well. Abraham believed God and God declared him righteous. So this is not something new. But it was right from that time that God would declare people righteous in response to their faith alone. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 5, he brings us in saying, look, now that we have been justified freely by the grace of God, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he contrasts Adam and Christ. Through one man, Adam, sin came into this world. Sin passed on everybody. All have sinned and death passed on everybody. And so Adam puts us under sin and the death. But in Christ, we receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And in Christ, we reign in life. So Adam put us under. Jesus brings us over. Let's say that. Adam put us under. Jesus brings us over. So in Christ, we have authority or we rule over everything Adam put us under. Amen? In Christ. And so we live out of our life and our identity in Jesus Christ, not from Adam. First Adam, Jesus was called the last Adam. That means Adam's race ends to everyone who is in Christ. Adam was called the first man. Jesus was the second man. Only two men who've lived on the earth. First man, second man. So you and I are off the second man. We are born of God. We have the life and the nature of God. That's Romans 5. Romans 6, 7, and 8, he tells us how we overcome sin. In Romans 6, God has broken the power of sin on the cross. Romans 7, yes, we have a battle in our flesh. Sin reigns in our body, in our flesh. But Romans 8, the answer is, you walk in the Spirit, you will be able to keep your flesh under. You crucify the sinful deeds of your body with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 8. There are other things that he touches in Romans 8, which I did not reference last uh, uh, two Sundays back when we covered Romans 8. Uh, it's in the sermon notes, but 
let me just quickly mention, in Romans 8, he also talks about other aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit leads us. How the Holy Spirit bears witness to our spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of adoption, enabling us to be uh, sons and daughters of God. He also talks about something very interesting, which is not revealed in other parts of Scripture. In Romans 8, he talks about the fact that all of creation has gone into corruption. That's why even in nature, things uh, uh, we have aberrations, there we have deviations from God's original design. God didn't create a world with earthquakes and tsunamis and tornadoes. He created a perfectly good world. But why are these things existing in our world? He explains it in Romans 8. He says, all of creation has been subject to corruption. God gave it up to the bondage of corruption. He gave it up knowing that one day He will redeem it back. So, in creation, we have deviations. We have people who are born with defects and abnormalities and all kinds of things. And Paul explains that in Romans 8. Why? Because all of creation has gone away into corruption. But God will redeem all of that. Amen? Then in Romans the 8th chapter, Paul also brings out a very interesting thought. He bre- for the first time, he talks about this. He says in Romans 8 that God foreknew. He introduces this idea of God's foreknowledge, Romans 8, 29. God foreknew. And he also introduces the idea of God's elect, God's chosen people, Romans 8, 31. That we are God's elect, God's chosen people. Important that in Romans 8, because in Romans 9, 10, 11, he's going to talk more about it. So he has introduced that in Romans 8. Are you with me so far? Right. So he introduced that. And then uh, Romans 8 ends so powerfully, so beautifully. As he talks about the love of Christ that none, nobody, nothing can separate us from. He says, no, nothing on earth or none of the angelic beings can separate us from the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus. God loves us. Nothing can separate us. Therefore, we are more than conquerors. And so we are going to overcome anything and everything because God's backing us up. He loves us inseparably. Nothing can separate us from His love. Right? So now, Having said all this, the next point of interest or the next issue that Paul begins to address, which he does in chapters 9, 10, and 11, is what about the Jews? Now that the gospel is announced and all the Gentiles can come in and believe in Jesus Christ, receive righteousness by faith, what about the Jews? They are stuck with the law. Hey, we are enjoying We're saved by grace. But all of them, they have the law. What about them? What is God's plan for them? Uh, Has God given up on them? Or is God going to do something with them? So that he addresses in chapters 9, 10, and 11. So we'll begin with the answer. The answer Paul presents to us basically is that no, God has not given up on the Jewish people. But he has a plan that he is unfolding. He says, you know, oh, this is in Romans 11, the conclusion part. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his ways. His ways are past finding out. That means his ways are beyond our comprehension. That means God has got a master plan. And God in his wisdom is working things out on the earth. In, that includes the Jews and the Gentiles. That includes the church and Israel. And God is unfolding that plan. And, 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 and he, he reveals that. So, in essence, what he says is that God has still, God still has a chosen people, a, a remnant, a small group of people among the Jews who have responded to the gospel, like, example, the Apostle Paul himself. But, They have stumbled upon Christ. They they can't connect with Christ. Christ has become a stumbling block. And at this point of time, what God has done is He's opened up the gospel to the entire world. And He's gathering the Gentiles in. And when He's finished with that, He will go back to work with the Jews and also get them in through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So that is the essence of chapters 9, 10, and 11. But the way he brings it out is very interesting. Because as, he, as Paul unfolds this mystery 
of what God is doing right now on the earth, that he is right now gathering in the Gentiles, and then he'll go back to the Jews. As Paul unfolds this mystery, he also begins to touch upon certain, a major truth, which is election, or God's choosing. That means God chose each person ahead of time. And we need to understand that. What is that? Uh, God chose you. That before time, even before you and I were born, God chose us for a purpose on the earth. And this choosing is entirely by His will. You and I didn't have anything to say because it happened before we were born. So no word to cast. <laughs> Election. God decided this. Even before we were born. It was a choosing entirely by His will. It was His sovereign will that chose each person for a purpose. And it was a choosing by grace. Meaning, just His favor on your life. So if you are where you are today, you've been chosen by God. And what you're doing today is entirely by His grace. Just His grace. Chosen. Election. But, as he unfolds this truth, there is the other side to this whole thing about election, which is our response to what God does in our lives. And we're going to talk about that. Right? So a very important truth that comes out in uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is this whole thing about God's foreknowledge. God foreseeing in and decide or, pre or predetermining or choosing you for a purpose by His will, by His grace. And then he invites you and me into that. We'll talk about it as we go through. You with me so far? Right? Let's start off with Romans chapter 9. And I'm not going to go through in detail. I'm just going to just uh, uh, touch upon the main things. And you, uh, you will see how uh, you know, in the notes it's explained. So Romans 9 verses 1 to 5. Paul essentially says, it describes his heart. He says, you know, I, I love the Jewish people. I love them. I'm so much in grief because I want them to be saved. One thing to take about from that is how... Troubled is your heart about lost souls. How much of grief do you and I bear or experience for the sake of people who don't know Jesus? Paul says, I am in so much grief because I want these Jewish people, I want the Jews, I want them to know Jesus Christ. And then he says, you know, these people, the Jews, have been so blessed. And he lists about nine different things God blessed them with. It is from the Jews that he says, you know, to them God gave the covenants, He gave them the promises, He gave them the glory, they experienced the glory of God, they, He gave them the service of the temple, He gave them uh, just all of these promises, and He says it was through them, verse 5, it was through them that Christ was born in the flesh. So what a privileged people these are. Uh, they are privileged. God chose them for this. Through them Christ was born. I want to highlight Romans 9, 5, very important verse, because there Paul very clearly calls Christ as the eternally blessed God. If somebody asks you, show me in, by, in the Bible where Christ is called God, you can point them to? Romans 9, 5. Okay, it's not the only place, but it's a very important place. The Apostle Paul calls Christ as the eternally blessed God. So don't, nobody can argue. Hey, he says right there, he is the eternally blessed God. Christ is God. Right? So as he goes forward, there from there, having shared his heart with him, he says, you know, so, Romans 9 verse 6, you know, so, you know, God gave these people so much, but they haven't responded to the gospel. So is everything a waste? You know, verse, verse 6, he says, is the word of God gone of no effect? I mean, hey, God did so much for them, but they're not responding. Is it all, is it all waste? And he says, no, because there is, there is a natural seed, but God is not, it's not just a natural seed. It's a spiritual seed. The children of promise, the people who are responding, they are the ones who will receive the promise and the blessing. They are the ones God is after, the spiritual seed. Uh, the people who are responding to the gospel. And then he brings us through this truth, Romans 9, 10 to 13, that these people are the elect. They are the chosen ones. So uh, 
in talking to us about that, look at verse 11, Romans 9, 11. For the children, he's talking about Rebecca and her two twins, uh, Esau and Jacob. And he says, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. And then he talks to us about Esau and Jacob. So look at this. The purpose of God according to election. Election means God choosing people. Purpose. God is unfolding His purpose through people that He chooses. And then He points to Jacob and Esau. Let's try to understand that. Are you with me so far? Right? So He says, look, Rebecca had the children in her womb before they were even born. Before they even knew uh, what is good and bad. Before they made anything, any choice, God already said, the older will serve the younger. He already said it. He already said that Esau, the older, will serve the younger Jacob. And he says, this is God's, the purpose of God according to election. That means God is unfolding His purpose through election, through His choice. But, let's understand that and then we'll explain you know, the questions around it. So God already foreknew. And he said, before even they were born, this is what they're going to do. All he said it. And then later on, after they lived their life, Malachi comes. Malachi 1 says, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have. And then he goes on. Hey, but isn't God being unfair? So Romans 9, 14 through 18. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly or not. He says, hey, is God, isn't God being unfair like this? That he would choose somebody even before they're born and say that my purpose is going to be released through them? Isn't God being unfair? And he says, certainly not. No. So let's try to understand Jacob and Esau and then we come to other things that he refers to. Election, the purpose of God according to election, what does that mean? It means God foreknew, God foresaw the choice we will make. God's foreknowledge is not a predetermining of your choice. It is a foreknowledge of your choice. So we are not puppets in God's hands. God is not deciding your choice for you. That is still your choice. But He knows ahead of time the choice you will make. And therefore, even ahead of time, He chose he knows your choice. So He chose you for a purpose according to His grace. Are you with me? So it is not like God just says, you will do this and you will do that. No, God is not deciding our choices. He foreknows, He foreknew, He foresees our choice. And then He releases His purpose through us. He chooses us and says, you're in the right place, you're going to make this choice. I will release my purpose through you. So, Jacob, Esau. But why did God say, I love Jacob, I hate Esau? So tell your neighbor, ask your neighbor. Just, why did God say, <laughs> just ask them, why did God say, I love Jacob? Just to wake them up, right? So, <laughs> just ask them to make sure they're awake, okay? All right, so now, the answer to that is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 through 17, uh, where the writer of Hebrews explains this to us. Here was the problem. Esau sold his spiritual birthright for a bowl of ragi kanji. <laughs> or whatever you like. <laughs> for a bowl of kanji. <laughs> He sold his birthright. And God takes that very seriously. Spiritual birthright is on his life and he gives it away for the sake of a bowl of porridge. And therefore, Hebrews 12, God calls him a profane person. A fornicator, a spiritual adulterer. Now, Jacob was not a perfect person. In fact, right after this 8 o'clock service, somebody came and saw this is pastor. I don't like Jacob. <laughs> so, okay, so those questions are coming. But anyway, 
Jacob was not a perfect person. Yes, but there was something very great about him. What was it? He went after the spiritual. Think about this. He wanted to get that spiritual birthright from Esau. He wanted that. And also another instance in his life in Genesis 32, by this time, he's happily married. Not like those young boys who are still trying to figure out marriage. but <laughs> He's happily married. He's got two wives. He's got a huge cattle, all these things. And he's on his way back home. He has an encounter with God. And he says, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. What more he wants? He's got everything. He's not asking for more cows and sheep. He's asking for spiritual. And that's what God gave him. He says, you'll be Israel. You'll be a prince with God. So what's the difference between Jacob and Esau? Jacob went after the spiritual blessing. Esau gave it up for a bowl of porridge. And God says, I love the man. Though he's not perfect. But I see his heart, what he's after. He's after spiritual. That's a lesson for you and me. See, we are not perfect in our lives. But as God is looking at what our heart is after. What is your heart after? Spiritual blessing. God, I'm after you. I'm after you, God. I want to be a person of stature with you. Israel. I have my flaws. I have my weaknesses like Jacob. But God says, Jacob, I have loved. He loves people who are after the things of his heart. But a person like Esau, who's willing to give up what a, a, a spiritual for the sake of a bowl of porridge, God looks at that person and says, He's a profane person, a fornicator, somebody who's spiritually. He's committed adultery spiritually. He's rejected the good things of God for the sake of something temporal. Are you with me? But God foreknew the choice. And so he chose Jacob. Jacob. And the purpose of God through choosing. So the purpose of God, which could have unfolded through Esau, now was going to unfold through so this person in the south was asking me this question. I gave him an example. I said, look, take my, my life. Take your life. God has a purpose. He has chosen you. He has a purpose that he wants to unfold through you. But if I or you, like Esau, walk away from it, God will release that purpose through somebody else. In fact, that would have already planned <laughs> So you know how you know, for a bowl of kanji, he will go away. <laughs> so I will choose somebody else. That person's already in line. God for new. Purpose of God according to election is already in motion. Is there? Because God for, for new, for knows, for sees our choice, our decision. Then in the same passage, he brings about another person called Pharaoh. He says, but think about Pharaoh. And this is sometimes startling because he says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart and then he dumped judgment on him. Hey, that's not fair. Because first of all, you're hardening his heart because you want to show your power and your glory. You harden his heart and say, take it boy. And he dumped judgment on him. What about that? Is that fair? That God chose them to become a vessel of wrath when they others who are become vessels of mercy. So he mentions this. Uh, this is in Romans 9, 14 through 18, in case you lost me somewhere. <laughs> Romans 9, 14 through 18. You know, what about Pharaoh? So he says, look, God will have mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. He will have compassion on whom he wants to have compassion. God shows mercy and compassion. He extends mercy and compassion to everybody. But yet you end up having people like Pharaoh. What about them? He explains this in verses 19 to 24. He says, first of all, understand that 
God is sovereign. So he says in verse 19, you will say to me, why does he still find fault? Meaning, why does he punish a person like Pharaoh? For who has resisted, resisted his will? Means who can tell God what to do? And then he gives us a picture of a potter working on clay. He says, God is sovereign. And just as the potter decides what he wants to do with the clay, and the clay can't say, why did you make me round and not tall or whatever. The, clay, the, the vessel can't tell the potter what he, what he has to do. God is sovereign. He decides what he wants. And he makes some who are, he refers to them as vessels of wrath. That means they end up receiving God's judgment. Others become vessels of mercy. They receive God's compassion and mercy. But there is one difference between an earthen vessel and people. He says there in Romans 9, verses 22 to 24. That's an entire sentence there across three verses. But I want to point you to verse 22. He says, God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. That means there was a time when God waited patiently with these vessels. Now, it is sad that they ended up vessels of destruction. But God waited patiently. That means the difference between earthen vessels and you and I is that you and I have the ability to respond to God. Our earthen vessel is inanimate. It has no choice. So God waited patiently for these people to respond to His mercies and love, mercies and compassion. They didn't respond. They went on and became vessels of are you with me so far? He waited. Long suffering. So if you look at Pharaoh, you'll find, and this is in the book of Exodus, you'll find that seven times, Pharaoh has a vessel of wrath. Seven times, from in Exodus 7, 8 and 9, the Bible says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Seven times. Then after chapter 9, from chapter 10 onwards, you read, God hardened his. That word God hardening his heart doesn't mean his arteries got clogged up. <laughs> it, you must understand it in the context of Romans 1, where three times in Romans 1, Paul says, God gave them up to their own wickedness. You want to go that way? Go. But, before you read in Ex from Exodus 10 onwards that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, seven times before that, Pharaoh hardened his own. So God was long-suffering, but he was hardening his heart. That means he was becoming insensitive to God, unresponsive to God. Moses would come and do everything. No. Okay? That's what you want? Keep going. And he ended up becoming a vessel of wrath. Received the judgment of God. Are you with me? But God foresaw this. God knew this. That's why he could say, I have raised you up to reveal my power. I know what you're going to do. But I'm going to, through your choices, I'm going to release my purpose. I will release my power. I will show forth my power and glory amongst the people. So that's how Paul unfolds this election to us. And then he talks about, then he goes back to the Jewish people. So even for the Jewish people, they were the elect of God. God chose them. God gave them all of these wonderful blessings of the covenant, of the promises, of the glory, of the temple. Uh, the fathers came from them. Even Christ came from them. He blessed them with all this. But the prophets have already foretold. Hosea and Isaiah already foretold. This is in 25 to 29. They already foretold that these people will reject the gospel. And the gospel will go to the Gentiles. So God's purpose was already announced. These people, though they are the elect of God, they're going to reject it. And the gospel is go, will go to the Gentiles. And then he says in Romans 9, 30 to 33, he says, But... The Gentiles, they are the ones who are enjoying righteousness by faith. But the Jews, they are refusing to receive it by faith. They want to get it only through the law. And so they are stumbling at the message of Jesus Christ. Because the Jews are interesting. 
I want to get it by the works of the law. But the Gentiles are happily receiving it by faith. And so the message of Christ has become a stumbling block. And he says, Isaiah already prophesied, Isaiah 28, 16. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, and they will stumble upon it. They will fall because they can't accept Christ and his salvation. Are you with me so far? So then he comes into chapter 10. And in chapter 10, uh, it, it, he, he continues to share his heart for the Jews. In verses 1 to 4, he says, you know, but I really want them to be saved. My heart's desire is for Israel to be saved. And, uh, you know, but they're ignorant of God's righteousness. And they're going about seeking to establish their own righteousness. Uh, verse 3, and Christ actually is the end of the law. Everyone who is saved uh, through faith. And then he begins to tell us about the righteousness that comes by faith. You know, he says, if you want to do it by the law, that's Romans 10 verse 5. If you want to do it by the law, then you have to keep the whole law. But righteousness by faith comes very simply like this. You receive the word, you believe it in your heart, you confess it with your mouth, and you will be So that's how simple it is. So contrast that to trying to keep the whole law. It's impossible. But righteousness by faith comes. You receive the message of Jesus. You believe it in your heart. You confess or acknowledge Christ as your Lord, your Savior. You will be saved. How simple that is compared to the law. And then he says, but this message, and, and this is for anyone who believes, Romans 10, 11 to 13. He says, this good news, this righteousness by faith is available to anyone who believes, you and I sitting here. You and I can be saved. You and I can have righteousness because just, we just have to believe it. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then Romans 10, verse 14 to 17. Romans 10, 14 to 17. However, the gospel needs to be preached. People need to hear this. The gospel needs to be preached. People need to go out and preach the gospel. Romans 10, 14 to 17. And then he concludes this chapter. Romans 10, 18 to 21. That although the gospel has been preached to the Jews, they have refused to receive. So that's the problem right now. The message has gone to the Jews, but they have refused to receive. You with me so far? You tell your neighbor, it's the last chapter. <laughs> See, they'll wake up, Romans. Let's go to Romans 11. So, now, what happens? Romans 11, verses 1 through 6. He says... Verse 1, has God cast away his people? So now he's asking that main question. So what about the Jews? The gospel has gone to them, they've rejected it. So has God forsaken the Jews? Verse 1, certainly not. Tell your neighbor, certainly not. See, God has not forsaken the Jewish people. He has not abandoned the nation of Israel. But Paul says, and he points to himself as an example. He says, like me, like Paul. He says uh, uh, that God has a remnant. This is in verse 5 and 6. He says, even so then at this present time, verse 5, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So now he's continuing that thought of election. That God has chosen some people by His grace and it is purely by grace. He says, look. God has a remnant. In verse 1, he has pointed to himself. I, Paul, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew. I'm of the tribe of Abraham. Like me, God has a, so, chosen some of these Jewish people at this present time. And they have been chosen by grace. So when you put all these truths on election that we see in these three chapters, election is God's foreknowledge that happens before time. His choosing happens before time. It is purely out of his sovereign will. It is not based on our works. It is based purely on His grace and we have no say in it. It's already done. That is God's foreknowledge. Election by grace. He foreknew and He chose uh, these people. So he come into this. So, verse, verses 7 through 10. So what happened? Verse 7. The elect have obtained it. That is the chosen ones. They've come into it. But the rest were blinded because God gave them a spirit of slumber. Now, interesting. 
Sometimes many of us have a spirit of in church. <laughs> okay. But this is something different. So what happened? The people who rejected the gospel. He tells two things have happened. First, they have come under a spirit of slumber. Sleep. So that their eyes can't see, their ears can't hear, their hearts can't understand spiritual things. So this is a spirit of slumber. They've gone to sleep. They, they can't un- they're so oblivious to the spiritual things happening around them. They're under a spirit of slumber. Secondly, they receive judgment. It says they've become, um, uh, this is in verse uh, 9 and 10. Their own tables become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and the recompense comes to them. And they are unable to see. So what has happened? The same people who have received the covenant, they're God's chosen people. But because they rejected what God is giving them, they've come under a place where they are no longer able to recognize spiritual things. Secondly, they are come into a place of judgment. Their own table is turned against them. That's what's happening to them now. They're in a spirit of slumber. And things have turned against. They're receiving the, the recompense of their own hands, their own works. And judgment has come upon them. So verse 11 to 15. So he says, so have they stumbled and is it the end of them? That means are they going to be down forever? He says, no. God has a plan to get them back on their feet. This is verses 11 to 15. But now temporarily, as they have stumbled, they have fallen And they've stumbled upon the message of Christ. What God is doing is, this message of Christ is going out to the nations. And He's going to gather in the elect from the nations. And when all of the elect from the nations have come in, then God's going to go back to the Jews. And He's going to get them back in. And it is going to result in a great work done here on earth. So he says, if the stumbling of the Jews can result in such blessing to the Gentiles, imagine when the Jews themselves come to receive how much greater blessing the Gentiles will experience, is what he is saying. So God is doing that right now. And this is what he calls, and then, sorry, one more thing. He explains this using the picture of the olive tree and the branches. So what he says is this. This is Romans 11, verses 16 to 24. He says, look, the olive tree. And all of them understood what an olive tree was. You know, if the olive tree grew and and later on it it was not thriving, uh, they would cut off the branches that were not thriving and they would take the shoots from wild olive trees and graft it in. And that will invigorate the entire tree and cause it to grow. So he's using that picture and he's saying, this is what God is doing now. The root and the tree, that's the Jewish people. That's the one with whom God started the work. But right now, they have rejected the gospel, so he's cut, all, cut them off. And he's grafting the Gentiles in. He's bringing them in. But at a later point, he's going to graft even these branches that respond. He's going to get them back also in to the olive tree. Are you with me? So he describes that in Romans chapter 11, verses 16 and 24. And then he says in verses 25 to 32, you know what? This is the mystery. Verse 25. Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. This is a hidden secret. But I'm telling you God's secret right now is what Paul is saying. This is God's secret. Temporarily, um, the Jews, he's working with a remnant who have been elected by God's uh, grace. He's working with them. Right now, he's gathering the elect from the nations. He's getting them in. And then he's going to come back and get the Jewish people in as well. Because all have been disobedient. But God is extending mercy to everyone who will believe. This is the mystery. And then he closes off with worship to God. In verses 33 to 36, is oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are beyond our understanding. This is how God is working. This is what he is doing right now. Amen? Now, I want to just say a few things here on how do you reconcile God's choosing and our decision? There are, these are two sides to the same coin. 
Both sides are equally important. See, somebody gives you a 2,000 rupee note with print only on one side. <laughs> Would you receive it? They say, it's genuine. Hey, but you need print on both. You the coin. It's got to have both sides. And so on one side is God's election. On the other side is your decision, your choice. Both are important. And you'll find this in Scripture. On the one hand, the Bible says you and I have been chosen by God. Jesus said, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. So that's God's election. He knew ahead of time. And its purpose, according to His choice, is being released through us. But on the other hand, there are many scriptures. For example, 2 Peter 1.10, where it says, Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. Telling you and me as believers, you and I have to be diligent to make our calling, God's call on our lives, and our election, God's choosing on our lives, make it sure, make it firm, make it steadfast. It means don't let it shake. Don't let it go waste. That is our choice. Are you with me? So God's election means God foreknew, God foresaw. He knew the choice we will make. And therefore he said, through that person, by my grace, I will release this purpose. That's something to thank God for. God, I didn't deserve it. I just believed. That was the only thing he was looking for. Believed in the gospel. God said, I'll release this purpose through you. But on the other hand, we have to be careful to make our calling and election firm. That means don't go back on your choice. Don't go back on your believing in the Lord. That's something we do by our choice. Because we are beings who have a free will and we have the power of choice. Don't sell God's purpose that He intends to release through you. Don't sell it for a bowl of kanji. No. Go be like Jacob. God, I'm after the blessing. I'm after the purpose you have for my life. Which you foreknew, even before I was born, you knew that the purpose of God, according to election, by grace, would be released through me on this earth. God knew that. But now don't go back on it. Amen? Let's stand to our feet, please. Call our worship team up. You can read much more in the sermon notes, please. You can get it off the website or on the church app. And you can study... These three chapters in detail. We'll come to Romans 12 next Sunday. So if you can read that before you come to church, that'll be great. Come to the service, it'll be great. Sovereign over us. God is sovereign. He used the potter, we are the clay. But there is this difference. That we have the ability to respond. He's molding us, shaping us. He's very patient with us. But he's looking for our response. What will he do? This great God has a plan for each one of us. This great God has chosen each one. For his purpose to be released through our lives. This is purely by His grace. Don't back off. Pursuing God. None of us are perfect. We have our flaws, but look at Jacob. Look at his example. He said, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. I want your purpose for my life. As you stand here this morning, would you pray that prayer? God has chosen you. He foreknew you. He saw you even before you and I were born. He saw us. And He wants His purpose to be released through us. He knew you and I would say yes to Jesus. He knew you and I would come here as people wanting to learn and serve Him. But this morning, would you say, God, help me. Not to draw back. Not to go away. I 
want your purpose, God, through our life. You are sovereign over us. Your plans, Lord, are good. I want to be that vessel, Lord, who experiences your mercy and compassion. Let's worship for a few moments.
you have chosen each one of us, God. For a purpose, for your purpose to be released to us by grace. Thank you. Thank you, God. Father, I just pray over each of us God, that no matter what the past has been like, today we will choose. Today we choose to follow you. Today we choose to serve you. Today we choose to live our lives for you. We want your purposes to be released through our lives. Not your purposes. God, I thank you that as we stay the course, you will make beautiful things happen. You are the healer. Yes. You are the deliverer. You are the redeemer. You are the restorer. You are the miracle worker. You are the provider. You are the God who turns our mourning into dancing. You are the God who turns our darkness into noonday. You are the God who puts off the garment, the, the spirit of heaviness, and you release a garment of praise. And so, Father, I thank you that through each one of us, as you unfold your purposes, we will see the goodness of God. We will see the greatness of your purpose being fulfilled and being released through us. We will see the blessings of God. Father, we determine today to stay the course. No turning back and no detours. We are staying the course because we know, God, you will unfold great things in each of our lives. Thank you for the ways in which you work. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone here this morning before we close I want to give you an invitation if you've never received Jesus Christ into your life you heard the entire message and maybe you've understood that God will save you God will forgive you your sins simply because of you believe, believing in Jesus Christ He has a plan He has a purpose for your life you're not here this day by accident is anyone here, you've never received Jesus into your life, but this morning you would like to do that? I want to lead you in a simple prayer, and I want, you to, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me if you've never done this before. Just say this with me, Lord Jesus. I ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my life. Save me. Make me your child. And help me follow you the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time in your life. Would you put your hand up, please, if you don't mind? Anybody here this morning, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. Anybody up in the balcony? If you don't mind, just raise your hand. I want to just thank God for what you did this morning. Anyone? Okay. I don't see any hands here. But in case you did, in case there's anybody who prayed that prayer on your way out, on all our exits, there'll be greeters waiting with a green bag with, you, with them. So let them know that you prayed that prayer, you made that decision, and you'd like to receive that bag. It has resources that you could use to continue to build up, build you up in your faith. Let's close with a benediction, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit, 
be with each of us always in Jesus name Amen We trust that this message was a blessing to you We would love to hear from you You can email us at contact at apcwo.org Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources Thank you for listening and God bless you